to always show x-rays that heal uneventfully and without complication, which is how every one of my cases ended as a resident since I had no follow-up. Uh, but I found out as an attending that with follow-up comes complications and comes issues. And we're here today to try to get everyone's opinion on how to handle some of these issues. So case one, this is a 48-year-old female with micronathia. That's a small, underdeveloped jaw. Uh, and she is a CRNA, so she knows everything about everything uh, regarding how to fix her hand and how to provide anesthesia. She was a restrained driver in a motor vehicle collision. She presented with pain in her wrist. Uh, neurologically intact to that extremity. It was a closed injury, um, and she got x-rays, and the first thing she mentioned when we went to evaluate her is, under no circumstances are you ever bringing me to surgery. Uh, and that's how we met her, with those introductory uh, statements. So these are her injury x-rays, um, and we'll see some better ones in a little bit. Uh, and you can see the PA and the lateral uh, that were obtained in the trauma bay after trauma surgery provided the splint. <clears throat> the first question that we need to ask is, as this patient comes in and says, no way are you operating on me, uh, let's discuss um, when can we treat a patient with a distal radius fracture non-operatively, and what are your parameters that you use? And then with that, how often do you follow them if you make that election, and, and if they start to move, you know, when do we pull the trigger on these fractures and say, okay, uh, I know we wanted to try to treat this non-operatively, but when do we move forward and actually start uh, discussing surgical planning? I'm going to start with Dr. Thoder because he's closest. Uh, how, how would you uh, approach those questions, sir? Well, first of all, in answer to your question, there is no answer because all of their, you know, life has gone through the they'll all do okay, X fix them, non spanning X fix them, fix everything. You know, after long enough, they all do the same, so we don't have to fix anybody. None of those statements are true. Um, Subtle things, you want to talk about this or just yeah, in general? in general. Well, first of all, the, the, despite what some of the literature would say, I think the things that, that are mechanically present should still guide your treatment. More than 20 degrees of dorsal angulation, a lot of combination, failure to oppose the cortices with your closed reduction. And then you throw age in there. You know, I just took that, that online board thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I am now the age where you're not supposed to fix me. Doesn't matter what your fracture looks like. If you hit your mid-60s, then you know, no, they do fine. Anyway, uh, I think the morphology of this fracture would, would indicate that you should try to talk her into your regional anesthesia, leave her jaw alone, but fix it because she's volarly subluxed. Uh, her lunate and her radius are not sitting in a collinear fashion, and this will eventually uh, go south. I mean, it'll heal. Uh, She's going to have difficulty with both planes of motion, flexion, extension, and, and rotation. She's short. I'd fix it. Dr. Woosley, if you, uh, you couldn't convince her, and she said, absolutely not, put me in a cast, how often would you follow this? Or would you just say, well, we're not fixing it anyway. Come back in eight weeks. I'll take your cast off and uh, uh, you know, have fun. What, what, what's your protocol for non-operative observation? Um, my protocol is I see them every week for the first three weeks. I get x-rays at every appointment. And then after their uh, three-week x-ray, if everything looks good, then I'll see them back at um, six weeks' time. And then if they're healed, hopefully take the cast off and then get them started moving with therapy. Great. And Dr. Pensy, how long, how, will you, how much will you accept in terms of motion? before you say, look, we're, this, this isn't working here. You know, we have, to, we have to do something about this. So after a trial of non-operative conservative treatment, yes, sir. how much motion lack do I accept? In terms of fracture motion. You oh, know, I mean, fracture we, movement, yeah, subsidence, subsidence, tilt. Subsidence and the like. Well, already I, I agree with the two prior panelists. I think this is, this is operative, just the amount of shortening in her age and activity level. She's still practicing. It's a dominant hand. She's intubating people. I'm not psyched about this. If this were a 20-year-old, a 20-year-older patient, very sedentary, uh, I wouldn't treat this operatively. You know, I, I wouldn't be as, 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 as encouraged to do so. So she already meets operative criteria. Two or three millimeters of shortening. I think shortening is probably, if you were to survey hand surgeons, the area we focus most on, not necessarily intraarticular gap. Right. Uh, and also which way it's headed. The palmarly translated fracture like this I get more nervous about. I think their prosupination arc is probably more likely affected. So, uh, uh, great. So what I was always taught and what I still teach is fracture stability. You know, a fracture that comes in in an initial injury presentation, you can't create any more trauma than what the patient already went through. And then by the time EMS picked them up, placed them into a splint, 
put them into the trauma bay if they were even splinted to begin with, and then you see them, where they sit originally is probably the most place where they're going to be. So if they're stable and in an acceptable position, you might be able to treat those non-operatively. But if they look bad upon presentation and they fall, they will likely fall back to the position they originally came in on. So when I look at the original post-reduction, uh, or the, sorry, the original pre-reduction x-rays, if I see that they are unstable and meet operative criteria, if they fall apart, they're likely going to hit back into that position. And Dr. Thoder kind of already mentioned some of the original LaFontaine criteria, dorsal comminution, dorsal angulation greater than or equal to 20 degrees, intraarticular involvement, uh, and, and associated ulnar fracture shortening uh, by greater than or equal to 5 millimeters and the added age of greater than 60 um, are the determinants of whether or not a fracture can be treated non-operatively. Now, we put her in a splint to tell her, okay, uh, we'll try this for three days, four days, and come back in, and we'll see if it moves. And uh, this is where she came in at, and this is her follow-up x-ray. So we were finally able to convince her to undergo an open reduction internal fixation with a volar locking plate. And these are her intraoperative x-rays uh, that were achieved at the, at the time of her fixation. And the question that I have is, do you feel that this was an adequate reduction or is there anything on that reduction x-ray uh, that you look at and you go, you know what, uh, it looks okay at first glance, but there are some subtle findings we're concerned with. Um, I'm going to start on the other end. Uh, Dr. Pensy, any critiques? Uh, maybe just a couple. First, you know, if she were going to go non-op, this is a, a fracture where I may have actually considered a long arm cast. And I think that for the residents and PAs, particularly the junior residents here, not everybody comes in with a collies. It's not a banana mold, right? This is right. the opposite direction. That's really important. So maybe a long arm cast. You'd pay attention to the brachioradialis and which way that's going to pull. In this case, I may have supinated or a long arm cast. Now, in regards to this, this intra-op um, C-arm image, I think it's important to know where the distal ulna is here. And the vantage point I've got, I, I can't really make out the distal ulna, nor can I make out if that's a true lateral radiograph. So I, I worry about DRUJ instability a little bit in her. I, I can't tell if that's the distal ulna. The other thing I worry a little bit about, any, any palmarly translated fracture, beware of the volar lunate facet or the sustentaculum lunatum. The, that fragment you have to watch. And I make a really special effort to see that. Great. So what ended up happening with this is I would argue that uh, on first glance this may have looked reasonably adequate. But she disappeared, took out her own sutures, and came back three months later. Uh, of uh, note, uh, she had been black diamond skiing. This happened at the beginning of the uh, ski season. And that does factor into things a little bit later. Uh, what we see on this x-ray is um, what Dr. Pensy had mentioned, sort of volar escape and loss with repeat volar translation of her carpus. She seems to be sliding uh, volarly. And on that PA x-ray, it looks like we tried to fuse uh, her radius to her lunate and scaphoid. So that's definitely not a good look when the patient comes in this way. So one of the things that we can look at on a lateral radiograph is definitely the increased anterior to posterior distance of your distal radius. Uh, and you want to see a, um, a to P distance that's about equal to your lunate. If you see something significantly wider than that, you have a malreduction or a non-reduction. And that volar piece that comes down is really the volar rim of the lunate facet. The lunate's always in line with the volar cortex of the radius when it's in proper alignment, uh, and some of us call that the calcar of the wrist, where the load transmission comes from the capitate through the lunate and is translated down the volar side of the distal radius. And then we have something called the teardrop angle, where if you draw a line parallel to the radial shaft and then along the volar aspect or to bisect that uh, um, volar rim, you're going to get a teardrop angle that in general is 70 degrees. And what we're talking about are these volar marginal fragments and these fragments that are attached through the radial lunate ligaments to the lunate. And if you miss uh, reduction of these, you can sustain uh, volar translation. So the question was, was that reduction adequate? And the answer was um, no. Sir? I have two questions about that. Um, did you consider getting a preoperative CT scan? Um, we did not get a preoperative CT scan. No, I said, CT. did you consider? And, and, and the point of that is I think a lot of these fractures that look more innocuous, you, look, you, you, know, you, you get a bad fracture and you get a CT scan, it looks bad, and it's like, wow, look what I fixed. Right. I think the CT scan is more valuable on these ones that don't look so bad, but you think it might. And number one, you could identify that fragment a little bit better. And number two, what approach did you use? Uh, that would be an extended carpal tunnel approach. Yeah, because you have to be there. How, how far out was she from injury when you um, operated on her? 
Uh, she was uh, seven days out from injury when we operated on her. Okay. So here we sit three months after fixation, and the question to the panel, and I'll ask Dr. Roosley, is revision fixation, do you jump to radiolunate fusion, do you do an ulnar shortening osteotomy, do you do a total wrist fusion, ulnar head resection, do you have another idea of what you'd like to do with this? Uh, she's now three months out. Uh, what, what would you, what's your recommended treatment option at this point? Um, this is this is a really hard complication to address, especially when you're three months out now. Um, I think deciding what you're going to do really depends on how much arthritic changes she has now at the radiocarpal joint. Um, so if she doesn't have that mu much arthritis, then you could try to do a revision. But once you do the osteotomy um, at three months out, I think it's going to be really hard to, to get your osteotomy plane, as well as, you know, that piece, it's going to be super small. It's going to be really hard to handle and manage. Um, I'm not having a really good look at the x-rays from where I'm sitting, but I think it definitely looks like she is having arthritic changes already at the uh, radiocarpal joint. So because of that, um, you know, I would jump to instead of fusion. So I think a radiolunate fusion is an option for her. Um, with her being a CRNA, um, I don't think that she's going to be happy having her entire wrist fuse and losing the ability to flex and extend her wrist when she's trying to intubate patients. So uh, one of the options that, uh, again, we kind of stress is when the primary pathology is present, don't create secondary pathology to fix the primary pathology. So the idea of an ulnar shortening osteotomy, while interesting, it doesn't address the original problem or the pathologic issue, which is the malunited uh, distal radius fracture. So when she presented to me, I actually uh, uh, talked to her about a radiolunate fusion uh, as an option, um, and uh, she politely told me she would think about it. And you can tell from this patient where, where we're heading. She went back out to Colorado because she knew people out there and uh, ended up presenting to me for follow-up, having had this done to her uh, with an ulnar shortening osteotomy and came in and said, hey, by the way, I had this hardware removed and I had an ulnar shortening osteotomy out in Colorado with a friend of mine. Uh, do you mind taking care of me postoperatively to kind of help me? And just to close this case, what did she do afterwards uh, when I said, all right, well, here we are, we bought this. She went back out black diamond skiing and I've never seen her again. So I'm assuming she's doing uh, okay and I'm gonna enact my residency principle that she went on to uneventful healing because uh, I haven't seen her back again. So just an interesting case on uh, what looked like an original good potentially good uh, reduction gone wrong. Case two, 62-year-old right-hand dominant bicycle saleswoman. She fell off a mountain bike. Uh, pain localized to her right wrist. Uh, she has no significant past medical history and is amazingly healthy otherwise. Uh, closed injury, no neurologic compromise. And this is her original presenting x-ray. Dr. Thoder, what are your thoughts on, uh, on this? And I'll give you some Better imaging, you can hold those. This was the uh, attempted, quote unquote, attempted reduction uh, that she was placed in. And we did get a CT scan and selected cuts are present here. And traction no, that, views that were obtained. Views yeah, good. traction views are what we see at this point. So now the major question at this is, are you concerned with the size of those small volar fragments? And if you are, is this something that we can approach through a standard volar plating, um, or do we need some sort of specialized plating system, or do you jump to an external fixator or an internal distraction plate, um, and, and how do you capture those fragments? Um, so Chief, what, what's your thoughts about those? Could you go back, back of the CT images? Absolutely. There we go. So, so this, is, this is like a plafond fracture in terms of how you, how you assess it. There's places you can, you can get to all of those fragments through multiple approaches. I think number one, you have to be willing to fix this with smaller hardware through multiple windows rather than thinking one, one plate's gonna capture it all. I think it needs to be fixed if we, go, we wanna go that elementary. And the uh, whether you need external fixation or supplemental uh, internal external fixation plate, you need to have all the, all the tools in the room as you go around the circle to try to put those fragments together. So the answer to the other question, I think you need something that is fragment specific, at least in my hands, uh, as opposed to your standard volar plate. 
So just to throw out to the audience, I don't have an ARS question, but if you saw this x-ray, how many of you would attempt fragment-specific fixation on this? Three brave souls, okay. External fixation? By the way, transfer to a hand surgeon is not an acceptable answer. We're not gonna throw that one out there, so. X-fix, okay. Standard volar plating, okay. So, to move the case along, she underwent um, uh, a sort of variant of a fragment-specific fixation, and she has a radial pin plate placed on one side to capture the radial facet, and she has this sort of hybrid volar ulnar plate with a hook and then a screw that kind of tries to capture dorsally, and um, we can definitely see that the height uh, probably restored, but she definitely has some residual dorsal angulation, dorsal tilt on that lateral radiograph. So the case here is not to discuss uh, the reduction uh, yet, but she comes back in, doing well at six weeks, calls at eight weeks, and says, I can't extend my thumb. Uh, when you bring her in to take a look at her, you notice her IP extension is completely out, and she has no uh, ability to perform thumb retropulsion. So now what? Dr. Woosley, what do you think? Um, so it, sounds, it, it looks like that her extensor pollicis longus tendon has ruptured. Um, so to deal with that, you know, it's probably an attritional rupture. Um, it, 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 you went um, dorsally, right, when you looked at it? Uh, I didn't perform it, but no, it was done all through volar fixation. Oh, it was all volar fixation? All volar fixation. Okay. Volar um, and radial. There was a radial window on this as well. Okay. Um, so, you know, she's not going to be a candidate to have a secondary repair of the EPL, so she would have to have a, tran a tendon transfer. And for this, I would transfer the EIP to the EPL. Dr. Pensy, when you do that at eight weeks, do you remove her implants at this point in time? Do you expose um, next to Lister's tubercle to take a look, or do you just do everything that's distal? And, and that's a great question. I was asking myself if we asked it, right? Do you need to go to the front and get that screw that was too long that was outside of Lister's and ruptured it? I guess you don't necessarily have to mm -hmm. if you're going to do an EIP to EPL transfer. You know, I wouldn't rule out taking half of her ECRL or ECRB and doing a tendon graft either, but EIP is predictable, obviously, in terms of EPL retroposition. I just, I guess the caveat here is I probably would not have all tried to get this all from the front personally, and, I, and I've learned a lesson about trying to get your dorsal fragments with bicortical screws. It's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Can you go back to the lateral x-ray, please? Let's give you a better view there. Um, I agree with Dr. Pensy. For this, I personally definitely, for the fixation, I would have uh, gone dorsally as well because I think, you know, to really get a good joint surface reduction, um, the dorsal approach is key to look at the, at the articular surface. To preserve the volar ligaments, you cannot get um, a good look at the articular surface by going on the volar approach without cutting the volar ligaments, which you definitely don't want to do. All excellent points. And then the other thing is, I, I've had a couple of these where the hardware isn't an issue, but it's the old-fashioned dorsal dorsal uh, callus that ruptures the tendon. So before I made it the decision to do anything about the hardware, I'd, I'd get a CT scan and see if it's penetrated. You know, I think it's a really good idea to to, to actually, you know, examine your patients. I know this is, sounds yeah. stupid, right? Yeah. But after your fixation, your first post-op, we document your IP extension. Some of these people with highly comminuted patterns, particularly if they go dorsal, they'll get a little scarification there too. And it might take them a few weeks to come back around and those exam findings are very subtle. Yep. You gotta document their EPL function early and frequently. Excellent, excellent thought. And uh, one of the things someone taught me along the lines is if a patient's having pain with um, attempted motion of either their flexor or their extensor tendons with hardware in, we can actually pull out that uh, reflex hammer, I mean stethoscope uh, that we use. And believe it or not, place it over top of the wrist and have them open and close their fingers and you can hear subtle crepitation. And if you feel that, that's definite uh, problems with the tendons over the hardware, not just uh, issues with scar tissue or with uh, lack of ability or effort. So I you found that. Do you have one of those? Uh, no, but my, <laughs> someone in the office mm -hmm. does invariably. Usually it's one of the med students or the interns that still carries those around. So. Yeah, we'll figure out where I can get one of those. I hear you. <laughs> Um, so risks of EPL tendon ruptures after volar lock plating. Uh, there's a few studies out there uh, in hand surgery in hand, uh, and the risk of EPL rupture uh, after volar lock plating for distal radius fractures is about 2% in uh, Zanke's study, and then Monaco's study took a look and asked 3,022 surgeons, have you ever had a tendon injury on the extensor side after volar lock plating? And 36% uh, have seen or had personally an extensor tendon injury. So it's not an injury that is um, 
uh, unseen when you start doing these. So it is important that you look at them uh, and examine them. And the typical causes are either screw penetration out the dorsal side, as Dr. Pensy mentioned, the screw that you get fooled as it comes out, you think it's in, but Lister's tubercle is, is, is um, fooling you, or uh, the typical you drill, 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 and then the drill plunges through to 30 millimeters, and, and you can feel it with your finger, and you've wound up part of the tendon with the drill, and then that sets up that rupture as time goes on. If we do do the EIP to EPL tendon transfer, what do we do? Do we move them right away um, because we don't want the fracture to get stiff, or now do we need to immobilize these patients to let the tendon heal? And what we found is that um, uh, in a, a German study, uh, level one study randomized, EIP to EPL tendon transfer either immobilize for three weeks or begin active motion a few days after surgery. Uh, in the end, it doesn't really matter. So you do what you need to do to make sure the fracture heals, and it doesn't matter otherwise if we immobilize or we move early. All right, case number three, some of you uh, probably look at this and say, yeah, that's what I get to deal with on a regular basis. This is a 58-year-old male. There's a rollover motor vehicle accident. He's a professional guitar player, and he has an open distal radius fracture with ulnar extrusion and a degloving to the radial distal aspect of the forearm with loss of skin measuring six by five centimeters. Neurologically intact, the wound remarkably is fairly clean, and these are his original presenting x-rays. Fluoroscopic traction views at this point uh, demonstrated this when we finally were able to uh, kind of pull some traction on it. And if this is our traction view, large skin soft tissue defect um, at this point, what do we do in terms of surgery? Is this something you bring to the operating room immediately? Uh, I know there's been a push through some open fractures that some of these can be delayed, but with an extruded ulna and a large soft tissue defect, um, do you delay that? Uh, what do we do for stabilization with this? And with the defect kind of right on the radial side, volar radial side, do you put a plate in this? Do you X fix this? Uh, and what do you do to the DRUJ? Uh, Dr. Pensy, what are your thoughts, sir? Is it highly contaminated with dirt on the end of the bone? It's actually fairly clean, believe it or not. Then so I asked the resident it, to it pull it. It was clean on. dirt. Clean, clean dirt. dirt, yeah. Because there is, there, are, there is obviously a difference, right? I mean, if somebody comes in, the, the only determinant in terms of infection risk and in open distal radius fractures is degree of contamination. So if there's dirt on the end of this bone, I take it probably in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. If there's not dirt, the resident puts it back in, we do it the following day. Fair enough. And how about fracture stabilization? What would you do with this? Uh, large defect, again, volar radial aspect of the wrist. Um, you have some soft tissue coverage, but he's definitely missing skin. You can see tendon uh, over top of that. So is this a volar plate candidate? Or are you X-fixing this? What, what are your thoughts? So I would, my, my first inclination is Palmer plate. I, I need to see good photos of the soft tissue defect because in some instances, an external fixator can be used to help you in soft tissue management, obviously. Mm -hmm. But in this case, probably not. So, I mean, if he's got extensor tendon disruption and I need to protect his ECRL, ECRB, the wrist extensors are really important to wrist function, and I'm going to be either repairing or grafting those. Did you say, I thought you said the wound was Palmer, though, right? Yeah, volar radial. Yeah, yeah. So probably not an issue. Correct. Probably just a Palmer plate, a okay. single stage setting. Great. Anybody differ from that on the panel? I, I'm, you know, I'm old school. I, I would X fix him and, X -fix. and, and see. Sure. And then, yeah. you know, come back at 10 days, two weeks, whenever it looked okay, and then plate it then. Uh, but I also wouldn't be averse to an X fix. You said all the soft tissue stuff is volar, right? Yeah, volar, volar, volar radial. So yep. you could just use a standard X fix, and if you had to percutaneously pin the, the rotational deformity at the uh, metaphysis. Dr. Woosley, uh, internal distraction plate or external fixator? What's, what's your go to thing of choice? Um, well, for this one, I would uh, I would stabilize it with a volar locking plate. But if I had to decide between an X fix or an internal bridge plate, um, I would do the internal bridge plate as long as, like you said, the soft tissue defect was volar. Correct. Correct. Yeah, then I would do an internal bridge plate for this. Uh, three different opinions. I like that. That's that's why we ask. So uh, let's move on. His comminuted fracture. He underwent an irrigation and debridement, and an internal distraction or internal bridge plate was utilized dorsally. Uh, the TFCC complex was repaired, utilizing anchors to the ulnar fovea, and he had a full thickness fascial cutaneous graft with an endocyte anastomosis to the radial artery for soft tissue coverage. And that's what his x-ray looks like uh, when he kind of presents in for x-ray review. And again, the, we're talking complications, so none of these are going to look perfect, right? So uh, your intraoperative uh, PA and lateral radiograph. Um, definitely demonstrates uh, maybe we're a little short on height, inclination a little flat, right? 
Um, dorsal angulation, probably neutral. That large volar spike of bone on the palmar side, we can certainly see that there. Um, and I will preempt you with a patient exam telling you that he has absolutely no complaints of carpal tunnel syndrome at this point. So that patient comes in at this point. We know the volar calcar, the volar side of the distal radius is the load-bearing surface on this. Um, if you see this patient walk into your office with a, here, can you manage this? Uh, what do you think about that? Do you accept this? Do you revise this? Are you worried about that? Is this a wait and see approach? Dr. Thoder, what are your thoughts? How far out is this from the flap? Uh, he's about two and a half weeks to three weeks from his original um, uh, uh, fixation. Was there any thought given to volar plating it when they put the flat flap on? Uh, I do not believe there was any thought given at that point. Because I mean, one of the things that, that's happened here is that it almost looks as though that, that stabilizing plate pushed, transla translated some things volarly, mm -hmm. and you get that stuff sticking out there, and you, you had a hole to fix it in. So in the retrospectoscope, I might have given that consideration. It'd be there when they do that, put the plate on, they're going to cover it right away. Uh, and that would have been the stage thing after I, I X fixed them initially. At this point, I guess the question is, do you just let it go and see how it does? I would be worried about his flexor tendons in the long run, and going over that lump of bone that's going to form there. But I'm not sure you need to do anything now until that flap matures a little bit. Okay. Dr. Pensy, anything to change? Go after it or, or leave it now that the flap's on and is uh, relatively new? I think you're asking for trouble to elevate a flap before probably six weeks in this case. There might be significant manipulation in that pedicle. And to revise the fixation, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd probably have to wait a little while and see how he does and rehab it. You know, the, the funny thing is you're going back to take this plate out anyway, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, this, this is a young guy. He's, you've got a radiocarpal joint. This isn't his salvage procedure. So you're going to be going back to take that plate out probably about six to eight weeks. I'd probably offer him maybe a revision at that point in time. Sure. So options discussed with the patient, and he disappears. Comes back three months later, was lifting a half gallon of milk, felt a pop, and said, Doc, my wrist can move all of a sudden. Is that plate supposed to do that? And the answer is generally no. Uh, but we try to figure out um, why his plate broke at this point, and we get some basic lab work. Vitamin D levels were at 15. Calcium levels, normal limit, infection labs, and full workup uh, within normal limits. And he ha uh, had a, uh, achieved an indium scan for no infection. We're just throwing those out there so we can't go down the infection pathway uh, with this case. So now what? The question for the panel is, if you come in with a patient who doesn't look like he's healing appropriately, do you, routine check, do you routinely check for vitamin D and calcium levels? What's your non-union workup consist of? And would you even pursue it in this patient? And now that he's sitting there, uh, he's not united, I'll tell you that much. There's no fracture healing across the fracture, so CT scan demonstrates no union. Do you bone graft this, and if you bone graft it, do you use allograft or autograft, or do you just say, we don't really need to bone graft this? Um, Dr. Woosley, you're up next in the hot seat. What are your thoughts? Um, can you show me the, the ISI, the radiograph? Did the plate break at the um, screw hole? Plate broke right at the proximal screw hole in that middle section of screws. Okay. Um, I know that there, I have heard of a lot of cases from my partners about the internal bridge plate pr breaking at the screw hole. Um, so, you know, definitely I would get infection labs uh, to rule out an infection, but you said they're all within normal limits. Mm -hmm. um, go back to the next slide. Um, so for this, I would, you know, obviously you have to remove that plate. Um, I would um, go back and fix it with a volar locking plate. Um, bone grafting, I don't think you really need it for this. I don't think you have uh, a large bo bone void, but if I did need bone grafting and he's a non-smoker? Non-smoker. Um, then I would use an iliac crest bone graft from him, autograft. Perfect. And do you routinely check uh, for the panel vitamin D levels in your non-unions, calcium levels in your non-unions, or do you just uh, just sort of leave those go? Um, I do. I do check those labs for non-unions, but I do not routinely check it for um, my fracture. You know, just like a distal radius patient. Perfect. So he underwent revision, open reduction, internal fixation of the non-union, uh, removal of fibrous union, reformation of the proximal medullary canal, iliac crest autograft. Uh, metadiaphyseal volar locking plate and vitamin D replenishment. And intraoperative x-rays and then follow-up x-rays 
So to sum up with the vitamin D levels, just to kind of make it a point, I never thought of it until about three years ago um, when I had a inf an influx from uh, uh, St. Elsewhere um, of fusions that had all complications and problems that came into my office. I saw about seven of them uh, within about a two-week period and started checking vitamin D levels on any complicated injuries. And it was amazing that I, I found that most of them were low. So insufficiency is noted as 20 to 30, uh, but deficiency is less than 20. And if he's slightly low or near low, 1,000 units a day, uh, and if he's really deficient, you want to do five or sorry, 50,000 a week for eight weeks and replenish that because if we remember from our biology, uh, we cannot heal fractures without vitamin D. And just for the distraction plate, uh, Dr. Woosley kind of knew where I was coming. Uh, used as an internal, external fixator, we know you can bear weight through these. Uh, Dr. Roosh and Dr. Hanel put out two uh, very good studies looking at that. But uh, Ilias and the AAOS has a poster and a presentation um, stress testing biomechanically, not published in journals yet, but static loading of internal distraction plates to failure um, was noted to be 240.71 uh, newtons uh, if they had central holes, uh, which happened to be the system that was utilized in this patient. They now make internal distraction plate without central holes, and that is um, almost double the amount of loading you can create across that before failure. So. The take home of that is uh, consideration of internal distraction plates with a whole grouping at that point, uh, we may actually have some complications with that. Um, and I think we've filled up our time, so thank you very much.